Good afternoon. Welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. You're tuned into Like a Stories. Today we are in conversation with Jim Sullivan. Of course, a huge thank you to Leica for hosting today's event. Jim, welcome. What's hey, up? what's going on? How are what's you guys? Up, Doing wonderful. <laughs> How about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh if I seem a little frazzled, uh, I'm on set today, which is wasn't planned, but um gonna roll with it uh so yeah, i'll do my best and hopefully i don't uh screw this thing up <laughs> <laughs> well look that's that's what the professional life is it's often let's not say it's always unscripted but even when it's scripted sometimes the script goes wonky and you gotta double down and and you know change on the fly so that's that's just yeah yeah i just gotta do it like i i I'd planned up i had my sl2s set up and I was going to like do what my buddy Jason Roman did and had all this stuff set up at home. And then at the last minute I picked up this film. So I was like, well, just got to do it. So um, here I am. <laughs> That's it. We roll with the punches. We got you live out there working in the field, which I think is just a testament to who we bring on. We want the people that are out there, the movers and the shakers that are moving us forward and uh and and photography film and and all of that so I, I gotta know you know jason roman's your boy yeah were you guys talking about this does he know you're you're coming on and doing an interview you know too? that guy um he's actually on the road um when is i he think not? he's in australia uh with uh momoa and so i'm hoping if he's listening or watching what's up buddy um but uh i think he knows Knowing him, he does, but I watched his uh, stream from what a couple months ago. And that guy is just the consummate pro, man. I love that guy. So, um, yeah, he's great. Well, look, I, I felt that ease from the minute you said, Oh, that's my homie. I'm like, All right, good. All right. If he's cool with Jason, this is going to be yeah. great. It's going to be a good <laughs> Even the interviewer needs to be set at ease sometimes. So, I want to, I want to get started, Jim. I just, you know, Tell us a little bit about yourself. We want to hear your story. Where'd you start? Was it, it was it leaving the corporate world or was it born with a camera in your oh, hand? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I've had like this weird journey. Um, I don't want to get too much into it, but I, so I'll give you my two, two minute elevator speech. Um, I grew up outside Boston. Um, I grew up in the restaurant industry. Like literally I was like um, busing at like age 12, 13 when, you know, back in the day, probably wasn't legal, but you know, I didn't care. I was making like 50 bucks a week. I was stoked. Um, so I worked in, in this fine Italian restaurant all the way through uh, high school into uh, undergrad. And then I went to um, grad school for uh, clinical pharmacy. And then um, fast forward, like went through the whole career, academia, teaching, and then it just got burnt out. And I wanted to do something that I love, passion for, and it was food. Um, so I quit, basically went part-time, quit my job, so to speak, and then um, went to culinary school because uh, I just, I knew I wanted to do something I loved. And, you know, culinary school was just like, it was so fun. I, it was like probably like that time frame of my life, I had so much fun. Like I couldn't wait to go to class. And, you know, when I was in there, I was like with these kids and you know, that's their college and blah, blah, blah. And for me, I was like, this is great. Like I'm not saving anybody's life. I'm having fun with food and enjoying what I do. And then after school, I was staging and kind of cooking, doing pop-ups, private chefing. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to stay in food. And then I was doing this um, artist event up in LA for like, 30, 40 people and people were taking pictures of my food on their phone and looking at the images, I was like, yeah, I can't use these. And then I just had this like that, that quote unquote revelation, uh, like, oh man, maybe I can like get into food photography. And so the next day, I literally went on eBay, bought an old Canon AE for like 30 bucks, a couple of boxes of Triax and really taught myself the, uh, art of, uh, photography i did landscape portraits this is whatever everything but food and that lasted probably a few years until i kind of felt comfortable with slowly going into the whole food scene and then about eight years ago i just kind of like full force that's 
been my rabbit hole, dive deep into that and been doing it ever since. And, you know, for me, it's like a, a kind of a perfect situation. I get still get to, I cook all the time, but like I get to be on set with, you know, great people, chefs, restaurants, um, and still be part of that world and do what I do in terms of uh, photography. I love that. And you know, what's funny is in looking at your work, I was, I always try to figure out with food photographers, was it someone that worked in restaurant or hospitality industry, or is it just a photographer taking pictures of food? Cause I'm convinced you can tell a difference and even not even in just the food images and in the images of restaurant staff. And I'm looking, I was looking at them and I didn't want to ask you in advance. I had to do it live. I had to wait and see. I'm like, Oh yeah. I, I yeah, just, yeah. I didn't want to know anything about the interview. I just, I'm just, I'd rather it's more put spontaneous, you know, you get the, Love it. Answers that way. So I was like, so it's good to hear that you did. So you do have the roots in the restaurant industry and you can tell it, it comes through in your work. There's just something about looking at these images that doesn't say, all right, this is a person that picked up a camera, walked into a restaurant. It's mm -hmm. like, there's just something different. There, there's such a bond in that industry. And anybody who's ever worked in a restaurant knows that the, the moments you share with those you work with, whether you're, you know, a busser, or a server or a manager it's like there's just a unique bond in that industry yeah i mean i feel like um you know whenever i see like you know food photographer jim sullivan i don't really consider myself a food photographer i mean i, I am but it's just for me it's like uh, a medium to portray how i see food and the whole life of being a chef and the industry and so I've, you know i've used still photography to kind of portray my passion, um, my love for the industry. And, um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to just, you know, work my butt off to get where I am. And, um, I'm, you know, I feel very fortunate to be able to be in this position. And then like, you know, in my wildest dreams, even just like being able to talk to you on this, I'm, I've never thought of that. So it's just like, it's still kind of like surreal. It's cool. Um, People in your email box like want to talk to you, and it's a cool. Yeah, I was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's awesome and it's inspiring. So how? I mean, we eat with our eyes, obviously. Yeah, I, I still, I was looking through your images. I'm looking through. It's like we have like Paul Bartholomew coming up. I'm going to interview him in a couple of weeks, and it's like you guys have such great work. I can't for the life of me, and I think I'm a pretty accomplished photographer. I can't for the life of me take a good food photo. I don't think I ever have, even by accident. What is it? Because there's just something about when I look at your images, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, flat lay directly overhead or angled or like, what is it? What, what really takes images or images of food and turns them into art rather than, all right, this just looks like some influencer shot it uh -huh. across. Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, for me, whether it's food, and I'm just, you know, obviously being honest and just how I see things, but whether it's food, portraits, um, sorry about that, uh, landscape even, it's always about light, always, um, you know, and I see things light first and then I go into composition, but I think, honestly, I feel like I'm not saying I'm not what I'm going to say is not like a, like a, like a plug-in or a, a plug, but it, um, the reason why I went with the camera system is because like I started off with another brand way back when, when I didn't know what I was kind of stuck, whatever, but I would see the images off of like a, um, uh, street photography, a lot fashion. And I just be like, what does that look? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of went down that rabbit hole and kind of started to like, play with uh like us a little bit but then you know it's a it's a big jump in terms of like uh cost and you know so but i felt like that's the look that i wanted and so i went i just i sold all my gear got the original sl i think the type 601 and um it's just ever since then i which was about six years ago uh just that's the look that i want um and for me, I think also what influences my work is like, I watch a lot of cinema, um, whether it's like an Anton Corbin, like the Control or um, uh, Roger Deakins films, um, even Michael Mann, like the, the way he lights films at night, 
and I see that kind of stuff as inspiration. And so I feel like when I go to take a still of food or the chef or whatever, that's the kind of thought process I have with my still work. And I don't know, maybe that translates into my style. Um, but for me, it's always starts off with light composition and then kind of just feeling and emotion kind of go from there. And that's kind of how I approach whatever I'm shooting. Mm-hmm. Let's stay with with the gear for a minute. As far as lighting, do you work with natural light as much as possible, or available light, or do you do you use? Um, I think at the beginning it was like when I wasn't really uh, up to par in terms of like uh, using uh, artificial light sources. So I would I started off using as much natural light as possible, and to this day, where I'm, I feel pretty adept in terms of using like um, either like continuous light or strobe work. I still try to have that same feel of natural light into my work. Um, it's just my style. Like, you know, I could use strobe, that harsh light and kind of like maybe like that Bon Appetit kind of a look with super saturated contrasty look. But I think my style is more the natural light using that if I can. I'm at a point now where if I go into a restaurant that's super dark and, it, you know, I'm not going to get that look. I have the ability now like to be able to recreate that soft indirect light that I like. And, you know, it's a style. Sure. Um, do I pigeonhole myself with that? I mean, maybe, but that's just the way that I like to photograph things. Um, but I can, you know, do that other look. I just typically choose not to, cause I just don't like it that much. Okay. And sticking with cameras and I, yeah. I mentioned this to everybody, there's some promotions going on um, on the SL uh, $1,300 off on bundles. Yeah. And- SL 35 and 50 millimeter. So for that quick plug there. So if you guys are, are like photographers or looking to get in, there's some great promotions going on right now, but I want to know what's your, your go-to setup. Do you have a favorite? Oh yeah. I mean, my stand, I can have it right in front of me is the SL2. Well, today I have the SL2S, but, um, in a 50, I'm a 50 guy all the way. I mean, I have 35, uh, and is that one most uh, of your stuff is shot on is the 50. Yeah, I would say 90% of my stuff. Like if I'm in the back of the house, uh, either with stills or filming, I'm on the 35 uh, just because it gives it more, I get, you know, obviously more wide shot and more of like a street photography approach when I'm doing the 35 in the back of the house. But for the most part, portraits, even food, I'm, I'm 50 pretty much. I just, it's, I don't know, that's my sweet spot. See, and mine was always 28 to 35 coming from, Yeah, I laughed when you said the, you know, the old Canon AE1. It's like, so there I got my film start on, well, you know, my first, my first big person. Uh, 35. Yeah. I, I still have that camera. I would once in a while bust it open. Like the way film prices are lately, I haven't been shooting too much film. Just, <laughs> You're only you know. busting your wallet open now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's such a, like a killjoy because I love film so much. Like for me, before the prices went crazy, I was always film guy first and then digital when I needed to for like work and stuff. But now I'm like, I don't know, man. It's like I have a fridge full of film in the, out in the garage that I've been slowly kind of like trying to like save and go through. But I don't know, man. I have like three nah. boxes of Ectochrome that I'm like saving for like project. Like I don't want to waste it because I don't want to pay $24 for a box of vector chrome isn't it bad like look at us we're over here it's like we're worried about which film is going to be discontinued next you're like do i use it or do i hold on to it people are like hold yeah. it. well Don't even still i've had this bo- i have i had five boxes of the, the fuji fc 100 for my uh i have a, like 1969 polaroid land 250 that wow. i absolutely adore and before they continue that, I was always with my daughter, like just peeling apart, having fun. And then they discontinued. I was like, Ooh, I better hold on to it. <laughs> and so I still have it, but I, I got to use it soon. So, yeah, I'd love film first and foremost by far. Take it to eBay. The, 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 the FP was going for like $250. I, I'd work with somebody who has a whole uh, refrigerator full and didn't realize how much it was going for. I'm like, you missed the bubble. The bubble burst. Yeah. People are buying them. Uh, it, it's sad. I mean, like, you know, this, us, like, I grew up, I remember, like, you know, my mother and grandmother having, I don't know what camera they were using, but I remember peeling it apart and just being like, oh, what the hell is this? This is cool. And then I have, like, 
images from when I was like four or five from the seventies that at home, like just, and I look every once in a while, I'm like, it's timeless. Mm -hmm. Totally. I, yeah. And you know what? It's it's for, especially for our generation. We grew up on. It's going to be interesting to see decades from now when you have generations that grew up on digital. It's like, is you, what's going to happen to film, or how are those people going to view? Because I think for a lot of us, it's the it's a romantic process. You had you needed. It absolutely is. I mean, I, I I was teaching a class this weekend up in Los Angeles for Leica, and you know, I was like telling the students like make prints like. Don't like go into like I was saying, don't go into your work and your photography with like social media in mind or like keeping it on a little screen. Make prints is tangible. And there's like this emotion involved when you have something that you've photographed. Um, you know, it didn't even matter what stock paper you have, but it's just like it just you know, save it and then you know, create like a whole shoebox full of images over the years and you know 30 years from now you pull it out and you still have something tangible yeah, uh, it's that tangible nature to it and you know yeah. whether you grew up with it or not it's like i took uh and i was teaching i think they were like 11 to 14 year olds i did a summer photography program in harlem and they didn't grow up with film and i brought in yeah. like i was printing printing stuff out and it's like whether it was an instant camera or whether showing them film prints it was like they didn't, you know, some of them I was like, oh, yeah, they had film prints because they had older siblings and they had them around the house, you know, albums and everything. But it's like even picture albums. I feel like those are what are, what's a picture album? It's, we call it a camera roll now. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, it's just like I don't want like the younger generation, even my daughter to like they want, want them to know what that is. And so, you know, I keep throwing it out there, hoping it sticks and, you know, kind of pay it forward a little bit. Or, I mean, it's fun. And, and I feel like you really learn to grasp the technical aspect and everything. Oh, absolutely. Like I was telling, I've been, you know, been fortunate enough to have been teaching um, within the last couple of years photography. And, you know, I'm always like, you know, throw it on the manual. Don't even like do the aperture priority or whatever. Just do the deep dive, take that steep learning curve, but you'll get so much more satisfaction out of learning how to you know how iso changes and then how would it would affect shutter speed and all that stuff and and then make prints of your work and see the progression of your work over time and like in my office um i've been working on this like personal project the surfing thing for a couple of years now and i've been like putting up like um my prints on the wall to kind of see progression of the images and over the years and like, you know, oh, maybe this doesn't work now. Maybe I thought it did at the beginning and then just kind of it evolves when I see it on the, the wall versus like scrolling through the phone or your laptop. It just, it, it just gives you a different perspective. I think when you see it like tangible in your, in your hands. So I'm a huge proponent for that. Totally. I mean, and look, you look at just the sheer number of images now. It's like, I think I had like 80,000 pictures in my camera roll. How am I going to get inspired when it's not, it's not even like cohesive folders. It's like, oh, here's a meme. Here's a screen grab. Here's a, an email I didn't want to forget to respond to. So I took a you know screen cap of it. When you have it on your wall and you see it right there, every time, you, you know, whether it's a workspace or a living room, no matter where it is that you have it hung up, you see it, it keeps you constant, constantly conscious of the project. And like you said, I think that's a great point in revisiting particular images on a long-term project that, oh, well, I might've felt this way then when I started the project, but now I've kind of progressed. I've gone this direction. This doesn't really fit where I'm going. I, I want to stay on the idea of personal projects because I think that's so important to staying inspired and motivated as professionals, especially for what you do. There's There's a very fine line. Some of us work very far off from our passions. Your work is right in line with your passion, which is great, but it also means you're super close to experiencing that burnout where passion becomes work. Do you ever have to flip? Yeah. Oh man. So I've heard other people say that. And I, I mean, to this day, I still don't feel that, but I can see how that like um, can happen where you're worried about like, I guess I'm fortunate too, because I still have the the day job, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so like when I take jobs or 
clients and stuff. Like, obviously I want to get paid for what I think I'm worth and, you know, the product and the work that I put out, but like, I don't have that mindset so much where like, I'm like, got to take every job to pay the rent or pay the mortgage or whatever. And so I think when that happens is like, you get caught up in the whole business aspect and like grinding just to make the buck where I'm not so worried about that so much where I can take that energy and focus to work that I want to be doing, if that makes sense. Totally but I can right. see how people do that. Like, and lately, probably within the last year, I've not taken as many jobs as I would have in the past, just because I wanted to be able to not cherry pick, but like take projects that I think fit my style of work. Whereas like in the past, I might've taken it, even though I didn't, it didn't really jive with my work, but you know, I wanted to get more work, but now I'm kind of like starting to streamline like what I'll be taking and stuff, which is, you know, it makes me happy like that I'm able to like um, focus on a work that I think would be a good fit and meaningful and um, and also clients too. Like one of my big things that I really um, do to uh, make my self happy and my work happy is that it's what I like to do is more about connecting with people. Mm. Like earlier I had mentioned, like I still don't like my see food photographer. Yeah. But like, it's more about connecting for me, like um, with people, chefs, even just everyday people, like um, that connection, that human connection, that's super important to me. And like, I'm hope like I hope that translates into my work um, because I do take what I do serious, but I always want to have fun and connect with people. And um, and hopefully that kind of like portrays itself in the work that I'm putting out there. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I saw it right away. That's why I was so interested to hear on your background about um, coming from the hospitality industry, because I think that is something, like I said, it, it just comes through in your work where, like, perfect example, my wife doesn't get this. I tell my wife, you can tell when food is made with love. Yeah. Talk. She's like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? You're crazy. I'm like, no. I'm like, because she wants to go to chain restaurants all the time. And I'm like, no, it's yeah. just, it's a bottled recipe and stuff that comes in a package, vacuum sealed and whatever, whatever. And I'm like, you can tell when you really go into a place and they put love into the food and they really are passionate about the eating experience. And that's the vibe I get when I look at your images. Something that yeah, might. It, go ahead. I was gonna say, it's like um, when you again, culinary school, but even not so much in culinary school, just in general as like a cook or, you know, the big mantra or thing is like, you want to cook like your grandmother would cook for you with the love and that, you know, special attention to preparation and ingredients. And so it's kind of the same thing in terms of like how you're mentioning, like you can tell, you can tell someone like, when they've put their heart and emotion and love into that food, you could tell for sure. Totally. I mean, yeah. you could definitely tell in my household. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let me, st <laughs> let me stop there. Um, okay. You said personal projects, right? We, we yeah. kind of gone off into personal projects. What yeah. for you, um, is there anything that you have that you're working on? Is there any like really long-term uh, personal projects or well, I'm glad you said that uh, or asked that. Um, so I've been working on this project. Like when I first started working in the kitchens and photographing, like I knew I wanted to do something um, in terms of a project long term. And I just came up with like because I love street photography. Um, and so I wanted to do something like um along those like the magnet photographers like what they were doing long term and seeing their projects and wanted to translate that into the food world so i started when i would go on location for a, a new restaurant shoot or whatever i always carry my m6 and i either have triax or t-max uh, a couple of boxes of film with me wherever i would go and so i've been working on this for like six seven eight years i think um, where it's just black and white, only grainy kind of like sometimes even like blown out highlights, super contrasty, but like just capturing the everyday life of, of a chef or a cook, 
back of the house live, whether like family meals, uh, smoke breaks in the alleyway in the winter or, you know, after service drinks, shots or whatever, um, just everything you could think of. And, you know, I, so basically I'm done with it. I mean, I could still keep working on it, but I feel like I got to, I'm at a point where I just want to get it born and put it out in the world. And um, my buddy, Michael in, in the city there, he um, helped me, he's designed books. So we have it laid out. Um, it, I whittle it down from like about 600 images to about 150 images for the book. Um, and now I'm just trying to like figure out how I want to publish it um, to get this thing born. Uh, it's just been such a, passion project so long I, i'm at a point where i just want to see it like you know in hardcover or um yeah it's like uh, i have like a dummy book that uh we made that i you know i'm using it to kind of like promote it to like publishers but which is really cool to see it in and but in, in the rough form but i want to just finish it and get it out there so i don't know if there's any publishers out there or you know anyone that like an indie publisher let me know because i would really love to like connect with you know that that world there we go we got a big network out there listening so if there aren't any, any publishers out there hey why not throw it out into the ether you yeah know? i mean it's i'm really proud of it i'd love the images and, and it it ranges from like diners and you know, pizza shops, like the, the the grime and the grit and to like, you know, high-end free star Michelin restaurants in New York, Paris, San Francisco, wherever I've been able to work in. So it's just the whole gamut of, of uh, cook life, chef life. I love that. Do you approach it differently when you go into like a, you know, Michelin star restaurant versus going in a diner? Mm -mm, no, not at all. No, I mean, Truth be told, I would, pref I'd love, I prefer to be in like a diner, um, uh, that kind of environment, um, just because of this, my style, I just really like that kind of vibe. But no, when I go into like, you know, high end Michelin restaurants in San Francisco, my mindset's still the same. Interesting. So, yeah, so nothing, nothing really changes. It's just the location, but you're the, mm -hmm. the same approach to the work. Yeah, and I, I, I approach people the same way, whether they're in a diner or if it's like some world class chef. I still, every person that I work with, I try to give respect, love, and like be personable and um, just do my thing and stay out of the way and just kind of like be a fly on the wall, so to speak, and in, in the kitchen. And I, I get it. I'll get in the in in in, in you know in the throws of service and which I love that environment, like hearing the pans clatter and chefs calling out orders, plates dropping, the sizzle, the heat. Um, I, that's, I love that. I thrive in that environment. And that's, it's yeah, a hard yeah. environment. I mean, it's a high pressure. It, it's hot. It is. It um, is. Yeah. And then like, I just want to like capture that. So yeah, I love that. So are you, so a lot of times are you working um, in environments like that when you're capturing everything other than the food and then is it when you're doing the food it's kind of just like okay we got you in a back room we're going to prepare some dishes and yeah see i mean like i said like i obviously love doing food photography but like i don't know like i thrive more in the back of the house but you know like for instance i was doing this shoot at this michelin star place up in la and they had me in a hallway which was like okay <laughs> And it was hot, and but then, but I had I kind of knew that I was gonna end up doing that, so I brought all this extra setup that I would need to recreate the um that soft natural window light, and and it worked out great. You would never tell, at least that I you know I don't think you can tell, but yeah, it's it's so you got to kind of roll with the punches, like kind of like today, like I had this all the whole setup, and in my mind, I was going to be cool, and then now I'm like, which is great, but it's just hard, so. I'm I'm reassuring you, Jim. I'm like it's it's all the information you're giving us. It's the person. okay. All right. Well, I'm trusting <laughs> you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> look at me. The the nice setup doesn't do anything. I know, man. You look all pro and stuff. <laughs> I got, it's like the little my little evil red glow over here. I'm I'm creating the vibe. So yeah, you got that, that Cinestill 800T vibe going on. There we go. There we go. That's what I need. I need to, to throw a little something else in here. It's a little one dimensional for me, but you know. Yeah. 
get bored. It's it's Monday. Maybe by I'll I'll change it up by by Wednesday. Or so I start getting bored with my setup, and I gotta. Yeah. So nice. I gotta retool it and everything. Do you ever find yourself jumping into trends or trying trying to go outside the box, new things? Or- uh, so I mean that's hard because like the the trend in the food world lately, especially with like food photography, is like it's almost gone retro to like 70s look where it's like um oversaturated but like this like faded film look to the images and um the color palettes are like orange and burnt orange and like reds like it's just i mean i pay attention to it but like i said it's not my style i'm not gonna like is it is it like an ironic take on like old like when you walk in like an old like chicken burgers pizza joint and they have like the really I feel like it kind of is like you would see a you know back in the day like a good house uh yeah, good housekeeping spread or like a better uh better homes or Betty Crocker kind of a cookbook where it has that 70s like style to it it's almost like it's like, cool. a, like a still life fruit bowl look yeah, kind of. Uh, I mean, it's a look, but like I said before, like I'm kind of true to what I'm doing. Um, so I usually don't look at other food photographers for the most part. Um, and I'm kind of try to stay aware of what things are happening. But I don't know. I'm just trying to do what I do. And I think that's- like, if people are going to hire me for my look and my eye, then cool. I'm not going to stray away from that. I think it's great to be like that where you're aware of where the the industry is going you're aware of what's out there but at the end of the day i feel like sometimes when you're too into the work of others you're not spending enough time with your own work with your own stuff yeah that's not that's completely true i think for me like the inspiration that i get is from cinema Mm -hmm. um music i mean music is a huge influence to how i feel at least emotional wise like i'll hear a track and it'll evoke an emotion. And then I'll always keep that in my wheelhouse or like the data bank. And when I come to a point where I'm going to do a shoot that, that might trigger, like I actually take notes and throughout the day and like keep this little book to kind of just write down like certain thoughts or titles of songs or, or a dish that I've seen. I'm like, Ooh, that's pretty cool. Like in terms of like use that as inspiration, but um that's pretty much where my my mindset is at. That's awesome. I mean, I, and I've always envied people who can actually take their thoughts and write them down and process everything. And hey, this song made me feel this way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's so interesting. I think as artists, you always need that edge. You always need something that allows you a shortcut to get back in your zone. Because yeah, when- and every once in a while, I get like I think most people I get into this rut where I'm just feel like my work sucks and like I have no inspiration, and then then I got to then it makes me anxious. I'm like, what am I doing? You know that as a artist or uh, what is that? self not self employed but like a freelance, mm-hmm. I just get in this head. I'm like, what am I doing? But then I just kind of like tell myself to just kind of keep pushing through and then then I start doing something different in terms of like projects that I like to do like I have a certain things that I like in terms of other than food and then I'll start working on that for a little bit and then it kind of re-energizes me and and kind of helps me reset or refocus and then also too is like sometimes it's nice to just step back and take a breather and like like luckily for me, I live in San Diego and the beaches here are fantastic and the weather and I just go to the ocean for like 10 minutes and just like completely like cleanse yourself of all that bad juju and there's like kind of recenter. So like that's important. Yeah. I mean, and you mentioned street photography before. I think that's such yeah. a so when you could just take your camera and walk out anywhere, especially if you're in an in urban area or a metro area or just anywhere that has something of substance to be able to take your camera out because not everybody sees not everybody's able to go out and be inspired or relieved by just walking around with the camera out in the streets and taking it yeah i mean i mean san diego isn't like the hotbed of street photography by all means but like i've actually taken that whole thought process of like you know when i'm lucky enough to be in manhattan or san francisco where it's you know really good street photography opportunities and 
take that mindset and I've been working on this surf project, uh, which was kind of born during the pandemic. I'm like thinking, what am I going to do that to kind of keep my creative juices going? And then uh, I started to just like go to the beach and like, I didn't want to do like the typical surf action kind of like that's been done at nauseam. So I kind of took in a street photography approach to it. And, and so just use that to kind of re-energize myself. Look, as a street photographer, I will approve that all day, every day of the week. I think it's just so good to just be able to, because you're really just, at the end of the day, right? It's not Jim Sullivan food photographer. It's it's Jim Sullivan. And Jim Sullivan is going to take pictures, whatever Jim, inspires Jim Sullivan. And and you, could, I think that's the beauty of having a camera in your hand and having a, a system that you feel makes you impassioned to go out and photograph life because at the end of the day it's what you're doing you're photographing life especially someone who's in your position where you really are photographing what you're passionate about you're not just going and clocking in and then saying oh i hate this i hate this i hate this but it's a paycheck no you're going in with the passion and what you're doing and getting paid for is part of who you are as a person yeah exactly yeah i feel fortunate for that that's look it's an awesome feeling you know, it's really, there's, you, you really, the more people you meet and talk to, it starts to really add up how many people are just mindlessly going to work every day. They don't like what they yeah, do. Uh, yeah. I'm like I said, I feel fortunate to be able to do what I do, what I love, you know, and I don't know if, if I wasn't, if I weren't able to do this tonight, I don't know, I'm, I guess figure it out, but I'm just like, stoked I'm at a point where I'm doing what I am and like I, I'm always thankful for it totally well we're gonna we're gonna get to some visuals here so we're gonna go through some images and anything you have to say Jim any stories or if there's an image uh that, yeah well I, I this was, yeah no go ahead I was just gonna say this is just aesthetically perfect like it's just a beautiful plate I, I gotta ask you I gotta kick this off yeah. with the, with the food how do you approach, I mean, how much of a hand, is it really just you know, them plating? I know a chef, that's their art, right? The same way that you creating a photo is, is your art. How do you combine creative vision when it's something that, you know, their plating depends, your, your photos partially hinged on how good the plating is, right? You have to, you yeah. have to given something to work with. So how does, how does that go? Well, I mean, like my mindset is like, you know, whether it's a three-star Michelin chef or like a pizza joint or it's really to portray all that love and passion that they've put into that dish. Uh, my job is to just kind of recreate that the way that I see it. Um, and like I said before, it always, for me, it always starts with light. Um, so I'm trying to portray in real life, how I would see it through my eyes, I guess. So, and with the nice thing about the typically with like, um, you know, the high end restaurants, the way the the ingredients and the way they're plating it and the plates that they use, which I, I'm a huge like ceramics guy, but like it, it's almost kind of too easy um, to no screw that up. So I find it really, um, what do you call it? Uh, satisfying gratifying when you know you would take that a salad or something that typically isn't that all aesthetically pleasing to look at and i'm able to create an image of that food that's not elevated but just um seen in, in a different light so to speak so a lot, of, a lot of it if you don't if you don't have an idea of the the plate so you're kind of just dealing with what you have they put it in front of you it's like okay this is you take it in real quick you see what your angle is going to be and just go from there yeah I, you know what i do 90 percent of what i do is on location at a lot of times restaurants that i've never been in so it's really challenging to go into a new spot and utilize if at all the light that i have to use um and then create something that i've you know that i see through my eyes so to speak and um the only time that it's not so guesswork is when, you, when i've been able to do cookbooks where you're you've already planned out like the dishes and the tabletops and the surfaces and 
the props, the styles and stuff like then you already know going into it how I'm going to approach it. So it kind of makes it easy. I mean, that's a different skill set and different different problems. But in terms of like composition and lighting, that's already set for me. So I actually really like that. That way I have a little bit more control. But for the most part, like today when I'm in this new restaurant, like I've never been here for the most part. And it's like trying to find those angles, the light that works best in my eyes. So it's super challenging. Interesting. So a lot of, yeah. So a lot of adjusting on the fly, kind of like, yeah, a lot of variables. Okay. All right. Take us through this image right here. Is this one of the- uh, this one is, oh man. Well, for me, like this image is really near and dear to my heart because one it's uh chef um, Reem up in uh, the Bay area, San Francisco, Oakland. And she is like super passionate about her craft, her food and, her heritage and, you know, fighting for women's rights. And she's just a beautiful person. But my other reason why I love it is because I've photographed it with my monochrome, my M10 monochrome. And I absolutely like, I think I've been saying this at nauseam the last couple of days, but like, it's absolutely my favorite camera that I've ever used, owned it, the files that come off of that. So that image, I, I could, if I could show you the image straight out of camera, it's pretty much, it is how it is. I think I might've like bumped up the highlights a little bit um, to her her, her uh, camera right left of her face. And I barely touched it at all. And that camera is just like, the files are just like butter. We got to stay there for a minute then because it keeps coming up in conversations with, with people that I talk to. And it's like, oh yeah. Everyone talks about the M10 monochrome, and Dude, it's like I don't like I'm not techie at all, um, and I can't tell you like about the sensor or I just know from using it and then finally selling gear to get it that I I actually try not to use it that much because like it's too easy. Really? Yeah, yeah. I I'm at a point where I'm actually it's just I'm looking. For this, like, I want to get an old vintage, like I was looking at this 35 screw mount lens that has a little bit more character because like maybe it would, you know, create a little bit more of a character image uh, with the M10, but it's just so clean. That thing is crazy. It's, it's uh, I'm telling you, I've had about five conversations in the last month alone where it's like, Pete people debating and, and, you know, they're messaging me to help them figure out, you know, you know, can I invest in just the black and white only camera? And I'm like, Oh, I've never shot everything. I've heard <laughs> everything I've heard I'm is you, you could take like a, color. just whatever um, um, color uh, image and convert it to monochrome and, you know, it'll look good, but it just doesn't have that feel. It's just completely different. Something different. Well, there you go. It's another glowing review to add. Um, yeah, this image, uh, Chef Morad, he's, uh, I was actually on location from Michelin a few years ago and we were in New York. Uh, he was guest chefing and this, I don't think it made the book, but this is like, would have been an image that from my, uh, book that I want to publish. Um, it was shot with my M6 with, I think, Triax, and, you know, a lot of the highlights have blown out, like you look at the countertop at the past it's blown out and then his shirt that he's wearing it's pretty contrasty but i don't care i did for me it strikes an emotion um so with like even like with my film images i don't ever touch them like it is what it is and then in post with my digital stuff you know i'll tweak things here and there but like i don't do too much in terms of like i try to like my mindset when i photograph with digitally is uh, how I would shoot with film to kind of get it right in camera the first time. That way, when I go into post, I don't have to do too much. And like, it's sort of handicapped myself because I'm not really good uh, in Lightroom. I know how to navigate. I think I probably use, utilize it at 50% of its capacity, but it is yeah. what it is. Like, I don't even use Photoshop because I don't even know how. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's kind of sad. Talking. You got yeah. you have a beautiful eye, just the way everything it's composed so perfectly that your eye goes right to the center. There's something about the the gradation of the shadow on his head and how intent he is. Like he's he's focused, and you feel like again. I worked in a restaurant 
this this hits home for me for being back in the kitchen. Yeah. You know, it's like, look, head chefs, they they always have like this aura about them. They command respect behind the kitchen and a little bit of fear. I went, yeah, when- yeah. especially old school chefs. Yeah. Like it is funny too, because when we laid out the book, I I love this image so much. And then my um, designer felt that it didn't really fit the book. And I'm like, okay, it's fine. We don't have to put it in, but like, I still love this image. A struggle, right? I mean, especially when you get to a point where you have to work with someone and Phil Penman, another like a photographer, like yeah, an yeah. instructor, he, he had told me a long time ago, he's like, everybody hire someone. If you want to do a book, hire someone, have them go through and curate and yep. go through your images. And there's going to be tough decisions that are going to come out of it because I think we do fall in love with images, but it doesn't mean just because it's not part of this volume that it doesn't mean it's less of an image or you should like it any less, right? You still have that attachment. Yeah, I mean, it's on my website. I Yeah, I love that image. And then the fact that it didn't make the cut is fine. You know, I, I still have a print of it and like, you know, it it's is it's fine. A beautiful shot. I mean, look at this. There's, it's, you think it's like a simple, okay, it's beautiful food and it's over. I guarantee anybody who thinks this is simple, <laughs> go out and try it. It's not. How how did you light this? What was the what do we look? Uh, I don't even so, know what kind of food this is. So this was shot for a restaurant, uh, an Asian restaurant, a spy restaurant. That, um, so I guess to preface it, it this only it's one strobe. Um, I have a Pro Photo B10 that I that I travel with. Like when I travel, now I'm at a point where I can travel with two lights set up. But for the most part, I, I'm a one light kind of guy, I guess, because one, because I can't travel with all this gear by myself. But um, so this is just one light that, you know, is set off camera right above the the, the, the table, sat at an angle. And then um, the, re- the way I wanted, the, the original image was just all these plates together is like a montage. And I was like, eh, it's kind of boring in my head. And then after we captured it for the client, I went down and like had people start eating off of it to kind of give it that like family table kind of messy look. And I uh, took a few more frames and I just like fell in love with it. It just had like an emotion to it. And um, it also like, it sort of reminded me like a frame that you might see in uh, chef's table, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like for me, like, and for most people, like that, that's the the pinnacle of like food photography, at least. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah, that's what it is. It's like that balance of I'm looking because I always love when I look at an image and it makes me want to look at it more, and I start dissecting it. And I'm looking and I'm like, wait, because you look at it at first and you're expecting to see, you know, in your head, it's it's almost like the Mandela effect. In your head, it's like this perfectly, and everything's equidistant, and it's not not touched. And then you look at it and you're like, wait, hold on. Th- th- did someone eat that? Wait, is there a bite taken out of that? And then you're like, wait, and then yeah, I love that. I mean, like, I love it. The, the original frame is like just too clean. Yeah. It was like, okay, that's cool, but it has no character. Exactly. And I think that's what really takes it over the top because it's still technically it's still perfect. I mean, the the light, the colors, the contrast, it's just a beautiful frame. But then you start to look at it and it's like, oh, wait, plates are overlapped, one's on top of another. There's food spilled here. This is over here. And it's all, I think that actually adds to it i think you you might i don't know this might be a i don't know if if this is a thing out there but it's like i know if i were a food photographer i'd be looking at this like why didn't i think of that and i think if i had my brothers i would have had like people around the table with even like drinks and stuff and hands and like kind of just getting real messy and like even like doing like a little time lapse would be kind of cool oh totally totally yeah here we go. Here's our, our our lead promo image. And this, again, I, I look at it like that. The other image that we saw two images ago, where it's like, you just have like a certain way you see things, your style. It's just a beautiful eye for creating a wide scene that's perfectly balanced. Yeah. This one, like, I, it's funny. I, I When I see this image, it was just taken many, many years ago, probably six seven years ago and it's my dear friend Val Cantu up in San Francisco and I would have loved to been able to take this with the monochrome back then but so this is just converted to black and white but 
I actually waited um, for him to, he at the, when I wanted to take this frame, he was way off to the right kind of doing his thing. And I just waited until I get, had that one moment where he would be where he was now and just took that one frame. Beautiful. I got to look at this a moment because, you know, I think one of the, the great and most inspiring things about talking to other photographers, looking at other photographers work, hearing about their process is it opens up your own mind. You know, we talked a little bit ago about keeping your individuality and your unique eye, but this is where it's important to really stretch because how many times would people take this image and they'd have the, the chef pose or you do the typical the chef pose, I always think like the arms crossed, standing there. And I think the motion provides such an interesting dynamic to the image. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I really, this image for me is, it really stems from like a street photography approach. And I think that's my mindset when I'm in the back of the house. Like, um, I'm definitely not a street photographer, but at least I take that mindset of um, that genre, the way of photographing into the kitchen. I think we got to get you out in the streets, Jim. Oh, I would love to. I mean, I'm going to be in the city in April. So I'm, if uh, oh, you're dude, around, you yeah. Oh, dude, you're down. yeah. Cause you have, I, I saw it right from the, right from the gate. A street photographer knows another street photographer. When I saw you, <laughs> I'm like, Tim's not a food photographer. He's kidding. Him. <laughs> All right, let's jump in. Get a couple more in here. What am I doing here? Just a beautiful eye. Yeah, that was just like uh, I. I mean, it's been done many times in terms of the cocktail world, but I just liked. I actually placed, had the bartender place the, the glass and the bottle thing there, and just on that surface and it's really just window light but we were over at the bar and i just thought like that surface would be cool and then and i didn't actually didn't realize he was gonna uh put like pipe smoke into that thing so when he did i got really excited because i knew like once that smoke oozed out that you would get that like emotion out of it with the feeling so this image caught my eye for a funny reason because I took, I am not a beverage photographer, not a food photographer by any stretch. I did for a YouTube video a couple of years back, I did a, a photo similar. It was, I, it was like a similar drink. It had the same, like, you know, going across and whatever they have speared there. It did not look anything close to this. That's the long story. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. And I'm looking at this now and I'm like, oh, you got the little vessel. I'm, I, I mean, wow. like, I use like uh just because like it's almost not too easy but it's just it's really lends itself to the way that i see things and i don't know i just feel super fortunate to even be doing work with these guys but like even if i were even before i was doing i would still like love that camera system and then just the look that i get off of the, the equipment that i use is just ridiculous I think that's so important. It's so underestimated that you have to be passionate about your gear. You can hear it in your voice. And how many people are just like, oh, I, I shoot with this. And they're not really. It's neither here nor there. It's about or it's about a technical decision. I haven't heard you say one single spec or number or chart or anything. It's really just it's about. the. No, I like I said before, I'm definitely not like techie or uh, equipment nerd or whatever i just know what look that i want and i just figure out what i need to get that look and like just happens to be this system and you know i'm not gonna go now that i'm working with the their sl2s for emotion it's just the same thing just a different media and like workflow but same thing so good Here we go so what is what is your favorite food? I got to ask. I know it's such a cliche question, but. One, you know, I, I always get asked really that. Honest, honestly, you know, I don't really have a favorite. I mean, I have like go-to cuisines that I absolutely love, but like <clears throat> the, I love Mexican food. And then for the most part, people don't realize how 
intricate and involved Mexican cuisine is. And I've had the fortune to travel throughout Mexico over the years, especially prior to COVID, like all through that country and really get to be part of like the culture and see how things are made and the ingredients that, that um, they have in Mexico is just, it's mind blowing. I, I don't think Mexican cuisine gets its due. I mean, it's certainly been on the radar for the last couple of years, but like, you know, when people think of food, they think Italian and French and, you know, how great those cuisines are, but uh, an Asian food, but Mexican food is for me just right up there, if not even like more um, intense. I agree. And I, ha I haven't traveled throughout Mexico and I probably haven't even cracked 10% of what the true authentic cuisine offers, but yeah, same with me. I mean, I've had to been lucky to, to do, and I still feel like I maybe have like 10%, like know what's out there. So this it's super involved. I have a friend who, God forbid, I, I get a really good taco back here in New York and post about it. I have an LA friend who's like, it's not LA. It's not LA. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, each region, I mean, I'm like an East Coast guy, but like, I mean, I'll probably get slack for this, but like the Italian food out here, it's not like it is on the East Coast, nah. but on the say on the vice versa, like the, the Mexican cuisine out here is you, you can't hold a stick to it. Like on the East Coast, like eh, it's, it's out here. It's just where it's at, especially right. being so close to the border, like the Mexican cuisine out here is just phenomenal. I know. That's, that is one thing I loved about being out there. I probably didn't eat enough of it while I was out there. You take it for granted. It's like you got to get that nice regional cuisine. There's just certain regions that are known for what they eat. Yeah, and it, it makes sense too, you know. Um, it's funny too because like uh, when I was teaching yesterday, and I always ask like foodie friends or chef friends, like, you know, if you could have something for your last meal, like what is it? You know, you get all these different ranges, but for me, it's always Al Pastor tacos, street tacos in Mexico City. Hands down, hands down. I'll eat that all day long. I think, yeah, I think that's uh, if I had one one final meal or one meal I had to eat the rest of my life, I think that's pretty high on the list. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. good, a little crispy on the edge, but like, oh, God. Wow. And then you watch the guys, or you know, for the most part, like when they're slicing the apple stir off the spigot and then take that little pineapple at the end. It, it's like, that's an art film. I could sit there all day and just watch those guys. Man, I'm about to cancel our three o'clock. <laughs> 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 that little yeah, marriage of flavors, you know, you get the charred yeah. pineapple. Oh, all right. Man, I can't keep going there. Jim, this was awesome, man. I, I want to thank you. Uh, let us know where we can keep up on everything you have going on. What do you have going on with the Leica Academy? Um, so I have, uh, thank you for asking. I'm so excited excited i have a uh, like academy workshop in san francisco at the end of this month um so so excited for that one i'm going to be working with chef kim alter from nightbird and uh, mm clay ceramics and it will be based out of the sf store on day one and day two will be on location at the this uh, at m at mm clay with chef uh, alter and then i have another academy uh, set for chicago uh, at the end of April, that's going to be a cocktail focused shoot. So I'm really looking forward to that one too. And then, you know, Chicago is a great city, so we'll definitely be eating well over there. Oh, of course. What's the best food city? I got to sneak it in. Oh man. I, I feel like, you know, are that you years, it was always Manhattan, which has obviously been like the staple. And then, you know, I kind of like, I still love San Francisco. It's a good food town, but I don't know. Lately, it's been L.A., dude. Really? Yeah. Los Angeles, that food scene has just been, I think, more dynamic than, than, than the Bay in the last couple of years. So L.A. is really killing it right now. Why didn't I have this interview like six months ago? I was in L.A. twice and I probably didn't even I didn't even crack the list of. Uh, dude, yeah. I mean, so many even now, there's so many spots that I. Still haven't had a chance to go to, but um, yeah, LA's killing it too. All right, well, I'm gonna hit you up next time, and I better anytime you, you April, dude, let you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a point to come show you around, definitely. Well, Jim, huge thank you to you, obviously. Like a huge thank you to Leica and uh, 
everyone behind the scenes there, Richard at Leica for making this happen. Uh, that is it. Another round of the BNH virtual event space. Leica. I made it. You made it. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. No, no. I was like super nervous before, but no, it was, it was fun. Thank you so much. Awesome. Huge thank you to you, Jim. And to all of our viewers out there, thank you all for tuning in as always. And if you did miss this or you need to re-catch up on it, this and all of our, our video content, excuse me, is archived online at facebook.com backslash BH event space or on vimeo.com backslash BH event space. You can also find us on Instagram at, you guessed it, BH event space. Everybody take care. Have a wonderful day. That is another rendition of the BH virtual event space. Catch y'all next time. Thank you, brother.